Wonderful. Well, thanks, Ruth, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'm excited to tell you a bit about Jump if you've never seen it before and excited to show you some of my favorite things about Jump. So before I get started, let me take you through a little bit of the plan for today. And of course, we'll leave time at the end for any questions that arise. So keep note. And as Ruth mentioned, use the chat and Q&A panels and we'll get to all of those. So I'm going to start by introducing you to, to what Jump is, especially if you've never heard of Jump or, or never seen it before. Um, Jump is obviously statistical software, but it's, it's sort of different statistical software than you might be used to. And so seeing Jump for the first time, I, I always love to show this because um, it lets you see statistics and data in a new way. I'm going to take you through some jump basics so that after this webinar, uh, you can get started on your own. Um, you can, of course, grab a trial, and I'll show you where to get that at the end. Uh, but I want to make sure you leave this webinar uh, knowing how to do some of the most basic and important things in jump. I'm going to take you through a tour of what I'll call the essential platforms. Uh, no single webinar could, could possibly cover everything jump could do. Uh, so I want to take you through some of my favorites and ones that will get you started best. And then at the end, I want to introduce you to the Jump Academic Program. Uh, so Ruth and I are both on the academic team, and, and we work hard to make teaching and learning materials that make it simple to, uh, of course, learn Jump, uh, but also simple to work Jump into your courses. So with that, let me start by uh, taking you through a tour of what Jump is. And I like to talk a little bit about the history, because I think it gives some insight into why Jump works a little bit differently than other statistical software. And so Jump started about 26 years ago now, in 1989. And it was started by one of the co-founders of SaaS, and so Jump has always been a SaaS product. Um, but one of the co-founders around 1989 uh, decided he wanted to make something different for statistical software. He, he had just bought a Mac Plus, and he really loved that it had a mouse and he could interact with the operating system in an interactive way. You know, before then, we were mostly working on command line. So he thought, why don't we have statistical software at SaaS? that also takes advantage of the mouse and takes advantage of this interactive operating system. So the idea was to create statistical software that was visual, interactive, and powerful. And so actually the first version of Jump was really a Macintosh only product. Here it is running on a Mac SE. And so Jump actually stands for John's Macintosh program. They just couldn't come up with a better name for it, so we all call it Jump. And let me just open some examples here to give you a sense, if you've never seen Jump before, what I mean about it being interactive. Um, I'm going to take you through all of what I'm doing in a little bit, a little bit more slowly, uh, but I just want to show you some of the power and some of the interactive nature. So here are some sample data. These are Hollywood movies, and let's just say we want to graph from this. So instead of having to write code, I can simply say, well, maybe a question of the audience score against the Rotten Tomato score. You know, are they related? We should hope they are. Audiences should agree. Maybe we want to know if this is related to uh, the world gross of uh, the actual movies. So we can size the dots by this and see hopefully that you know, the movies that are doing better make more money. Of course, there's some notable outliers here. Points that are strange because they're low scores, uh, but they're high gross. So Pirates of the Caribbean and uh, what's this one here? So this is Transformers, Dark of the Moon. So graphing in Jump is interactive. We can simply drag and drop variables around. Let's do something a little more basic. What if we just wanted distributions of some of these? So I'll grab some columns, click them into a roll, click OK. What Jump's going to do is create the histograms and frequency distribution plots. I'll talk about this a little bit more, but things in Jump are interactive. So when I select observations in one histogram, or really in any plot, they're going to be selected everywhere. And this gives us a nice way to interact with our data sets. If I click on the action movies, I could see where they are in the number of theaters opening. I can even see them in the data table. So when I select them here, they're selected everywhere. Jump also allows you to make special kinds of graphs. So I'll pull up some San Francisco crime data, and very quickly we can just make a street map, actually, of San Francisco, and uh, look at the sort of geographic density of different crimes. And so this connects out to open street maps. And this is interactive too. I can zoom into a particular region, it'll download the more high definition street map, and we can explore visually. If we have data such as US demographics, something where we have a state variable, we can also graph these. So I'll take state, put it into map shape, we get a canvas for the United States. Let's look at the smokers across the country. Maybe we see some hot spots. You know, sometimes there is a geographic story in your data. So making a map like this is really what communicates or gives you meaning uh, from your data sets. Now, Jump is also great for teaching, you know, not just for analyzing data, not just for visualizing data, but also for teaching concepts. So we develop teaching modules as well. So here's one that I like. This is uh, looking at really the simulations about regression. So if we take multiple samples from some population, we can see for each individual sample what line of fit we get. And so we get a really visual example of, you know, why do we have a confidence band around a regression line? Well, every sample is one instantiation from that population. And there is some true effect out there, a true relationship, but each sample only gives us a guess of that. 
One thing I also like about this uh, demonstration is, let's fit a line to our sample data, and I like to have students do this. I say grab a point near the middle, move it up and down. We can see the line change in real time. But one thing that's nice about this, let's drag out the axes. Remember, everything in Jump is interactive, so we can just move things around. I'll put a point way up on the regression line, and if we move that one, we can feel the tug of that point because of the leverage it's exerting on that actual line of fit. And so Jump makes the uh, ideas in statistics and the concepts in statistics interactive and visual. And there's one I like for sampling distributions, a little bit more basic, but the idea of taking samples from a population and drawing that sampling distribution in real time. We can do a number of samples at once. I'll just pull a thousand all at once, and we can see that normally distributed sampling distribution of the mean. You can also show things like the central limit theorem. Suppose we take samples from a skewed right population, something where with small sample sizes, we wouldn't expect to see a normally distributed sampling distribution. But with samples of a sufficient size, let's just do 60, you know, we can see that the sampling distribution is drawn towards that Gaussian shape. And so we can demonstrate concepts that are otherwise a little bit mysterious sometimes for students, but making things interactive and physical uh, can put them into a context that makes them more easily understood. All right, so let me step back. I did a, a bunch of things really quickly there, but the idea that Jump is visual and interactive um, should be should be meaningful. I mean, this is different than a lot of other statistical software. You know, I've used Jump for, for 10 years and, and actually use most statistical software. I think it's worthwhile to learn lots of things because you want to deploy software uh, in the context they're most appropriate. And Jump fits in a very special place. You know, when you're doing analyses on your desktop, Jump is an in-memory tool for Mac and Windows. So when you're working with data sets that, you know, aren't big data, you wouldn't want to pull in 4 billion rows, but Jump's going to be fine with 20 million rows of data, something that can fit in your, your RAM on your computer. And Jump is actually a family of products, too. I'll just point this out, then we can come back to it at the end. You know, Jump, what I'm showing you here is actually Jump Pro. Uh, it's one of several products that, that Jump makes. So we have Jump and Jump Pro. They're really the analytics uh, and the analysis part of Jump. And then we have Jump Clinical and Jump Genomic specialty products for types of data, uh, certainly when you're working with genetics or working with clinical process and clinical trials. And then there's also uh, the Jump Graph Builder for iPad. You know, that graphing platform I showed you where I was making graphs, well, that's also on the iPad. And so you can download this for free from the App Store. Uh, and this is a great way, especially when you're just graphing data or playing with data on your own, uh, you can just do it on the road. And so we'll come back and talk about some of those later. Now again, Jump is Mac and Windows both. The versions are co-released, which means that they're developed together. They're going to look identical, and except for minor differences because of the operating system, they're going to work the same way. And so I'll point out differences when there are them, uh, but really note that you can get this on whatever operating system you want. Today I'm going to be showing Jump on the Mac, as you can see, and I'm going to be using Jump 13. This is our version that was just released a few weeks ago. And so if you uh, were to download a trial right now, this is what you would get. If you're at a university that already has Jump, and, and most universities do, so check with your IT people, uh, they should be getting Jump 13 soon. They just have to deploy it. All right, so with that, let me step through some of the Jump bas basics. So how to get Jump to do the things you want it to do, and, and how is Jump a little bit different from other software? Well, let's start with the most basic question. How are you going to get data into Jump? Well, because Jump is modern statistical software, it was developed at a time when we had a mouse and we had an operating system that was interactive, you don't have to write lines of code to bring data in. Uh, you can simply do file open. A Jump will open all sorts of file types, CSVs, DAT files. You can open from Excel, SAS, Minitab. Uh, most file types are, are accessible to Jump. You can also open directly from a website. So if you do internet open and pass Jump a URL, uh, Jump's able to parse those tables uh, on the web. So importing data is very straightforward. Making a new data table is as simple as file new, and you can enter in your own data. And if you want to work with sample data, Jump actually comes with a whole lot of it. So under the Help menu, there's a Sample Data section. And let me show you this really quickly, because in the webinar today, I'm going to be working extensively with sample data. So if you want to follow along with this later, and there is going to be a recording of this, so don't feel like you have to do it right now, uh, you'll want to go to the Sample Data Index, and I like to just open the Sample Data Directory. That way you can go to the, the data sets you want directly. But if you're just exploring the sample data, note that they're organized by types of analysis on the left, and types of sort of industry on the right. So if you're looking for data sets that deal with food and nutrition, uh, go right to that section. Also, the teaching simulations that I mentioned, they're under the teaching resources section at the bottom. So there's uh, data sets that are specifically good for examples of teaching, uh, scripts for teaching, calculators. So if you still teach and show uh, sort of basic entry from summary statistics, we have some calculators that let students do it that way, and simulators that allow you to simulate different situations. So check out the sample data directory. Now, 
for this first little bit, I'm just going to pull open a, a sample data set I like called Restaurant Tips. And I like this because it's pretty basic. We have 157 rows, and we only have uh, seven columns. So some basic information about the tips and the bills uh, for different tables experienced at a restaurant over a few-week period. Now, before we do anything about how, how I think Jump thinks, and I think this is my favorite section, um, the mind of Jump, let's talk about some basic navigation issues. And if you've used other statistical software, or if you've even used Excel, uh, some of this will be pretty familiar. So first, basics of the interface. Now, you may notice at the bottom right-hand side, I have the Jump Home window. And what this shows is the open windows that we have so far. I have the restaurant tips file. I also have uh, this Jump Basics for Professors journal. I'm actually using, this is actually a piece of Jump to give my presentation. Uh, and journals are great under new, new journal. Uh, they allow you to make sections just like I'm showing here, add links. Uh, you can even put analyses in there. So the basics of Jump is really that it has a home window, a data set, and any other windows like journals or script windows you have open. Now, when you first install Jump, you're going to get a window called the Jump Starter. And I'm going to pull it open from my window menu. And this is nice when you're just getting started because it shows for the different categories in Jump, the uh, locations in Jump where you do those analyses, so the platforms, as we'll call them. So for instance, if you're working with clustering and you want to know how to do a hierarchical cluster, you can click directly to it here. Now, the Jump Starter, in essence, recreates the menu structure. So under the Analyze menu, clustering is where we get the hierarchical cluster. But the starter is a nice way when you're first getting used to jump to scroll through a list of really analyses and jump right to those particular platforms in which the analyses live. So we'll come back and look at the jump starter a little bit later, but I recommend when you're first getting to start with jump, it's actually good to dive right into the menus. And I'm going to give you some tips on, on finding things in jump and sort of knowing about how jump thinks of data so you can guess where jump would put those analyses. All right, so that's the basic inter interface. Uh, let's talk about the difference between, especially useful in Jump, uh, data and metadata. Now, the data, of course, is what's in our data table, you know, the actual observations we have. Uh, but there's also metadata that's important to Jump. So one really important one is, if, if I'll right-click on a column here, if I go to column info, so the information or the characteristics of the column, uh, this is the metadata Jump is storing about the column. So the data type, these data are numeric. Modeling type, something I'll come back to in a second, actually really important for Jump. Uh, in essence, this is what you're telling Jump the observations in this column actually mean. That is, are they continuous? Are they numeric? Do they mean something on a real scale? Uh, or are they simply categories? And notice that this column, tip amount, we have the dollars in there. So I've actually told it that this is currency. We have the number of decimal places, and we have the type of currency. Under column properties, there's a whole lot of other metadata you can apply to a column. Uh, some of these we'll talk about later, uh, but basically, if you need to modify what Jump thinks about a column, you're going to get to it in column info. All right, so that's the columns. You'll also notice that just structurally in the table, the columns are also listed along the left-hand side. And when I click on any of these, the appropriate column is selected. Now, this is nice when you have very large data sets. You know, I have some with hundreds of thousands of columns, and it's actually nice to be able to organize and group your columns. We could actually just grab some columns on the left, right-click, and group them. So we can keep our, our columns list even quite organized. And so that's actually a handy thing. Now, let's talk about the rows, though. So rows can also accept metadata. And the two important ones are hiding and excluding. So I'll just grab some rows. Let's say rows 4, 5, and 6. And let's imagine that for, for whatever reason, we know these observations shouldn't be counted in an analysis. And we also don't want to show them in any graphs. They're just bad data for some reason or data we want to exclude. Now, you don't need to delete them from your data set. Instead, we're going to apply some metadata to the rows. I just right click. Right clicking and jump is something to always try. There's always some option behind a right click. And notice we have the option to hide and exclude at the same time. You also have the option to just exclude or just hide. Let me do hide and exclude, and notice what jump does is adds to the rows the little symbols showing that the data here are excluded. Exclusion means that it won't be counted when we do an analysis, and hidden, which means they won't be shown when we make a graph. There are times you may want to only hide or only exclude. For instance, you want to show some outliers in a graph, but you actually don't want to count them in the analyses, so you would only exclude those rows but not hide them. But since we're mostly doing the same operation at the same time, uh, there's the option to do them both at once. So let me bring those back into the data table. All right, one other thing about Jump Navigation, and you saw me do this earlier, is Jump is interactive. And what I mean by this is when I brought up the distribution platform, something I'm going to talk a lot about, 
This was where we got histograms. You notice that when I select observations, I'll just select the lowest table for tip amounts, everything gets selected. So I see in the other plots, those observations. I also see in the data table, those operations. Now this confers some pretty substantial benefits. What if I grab the points that are kind of outlying in tip amount? I can right click and exclude them right from there. Right, so I can select anywhere and I can apply operations back to the table from anywhere. And this becomes really useful, especially in data exploration. Now there's another side to interactivity, which is that these red triangles you see everywhere. So I have one here, I have one next to credit card, and I have one next to tip amount. These are really the location where we produce more analyses. Jump is built in a kind of a deeply hierarchical way, which is to say, as you produce output, Jump will give you new options that make sense to do at that time. Now, this is actually kind of an important point, and it brings me to the next section, which is how is Jump thinking about analysis and how is Jump thinking about data? And Jump's doing it, and this is my little pithy statement for this, Jump thinks about the situation you're in, not the statistic you're looking for. Um, let me back up and just say the mind of Jump. Obviously, I don't think Jump has a real mind, uh, but Jump has had developers that have been with Jump for the 26 years it's been developed. In fact, John Saul, who first started Jump, he's still the principal architect and chief developer of Jump. So all these developers over all this time who have their own conceptions about how analysis and data should work, they've put themselves into Jump. So in a sense, we're using Jump in, in their minds. And so I like to think about the mind of Jump as both how you have to communicate with the software to get it to do what you want it to do, but also how it's organized and how it thinks about data. And the way that Jump does this, again, is about the situation. And the situation, as I define it, is the statistical context you find yourself in. Now, what does that mean? And I'm going to come back to, remember I said the modeling type was important. So context, as far as Jump is concerned, is what type of data you're using for an analysis. And Jump distinguishes really three types of data. So qualitative data can be nominal or ordinal. Uh, that distinction is really nominal, meaning just we have observed categories, like whether somebody used a credit card or not. Uh, or they can be ordinal qualitative. So things like t-shirt sizes, small, medium, and large. Those are strictly ordered, uh, but we don't think that small has to be exactly as different from medium as medium is from large. And then we have quantitative data, data that's actually measured numerically and is on a scale. You know, formally we would say interval scaled or ratio scaled. Uh, but for us, we can just think about numbers that actually mean numbers. So tip amount and bill amount here. Now I'll stop and say numbers don't always mean numbers or don't always mean something numeric. For instance, I've seen surveys where uh, people store gender as one, two, and three. So one and two for male and female, and then three for did not respond. We don't think there's anything actually numeric or scale about those numbers. Uh, they just represent categories. And so in Jump's mind, or for us to interact with Jump, we need Jump to know what the data in each of our columns actually reflect in the world. And the way we do that is the modeling type of the data. Now we can get to modeling type a number of ways. Remember I right clicked a column and went to column info? Well, the modeling type is right there. We can select it and notice for credit card use, it's nominal right now. On the left hand side in the columns list, we also have an indication of the modeling type. So if I click on the little red histograms here, notice that that column is set to be nominal. All right, so Jump wants to know about the modeling type and it does for important reasons. The type of modeling or the modeling type of a variable uh, constrains the types of analyses that are appropriate for it. For instance, if I want Jump to show me a histogram or show me some representation of frequencies, well, for credit card use, that column, I should get a frequency distribution plot and maybe a table of how often yeses and nos were, were used or how often credit cards were used. But if I ask the same question, the same situation about tip amount, that is, I want a, a, some representation of what observations I got and some measure of center, well, I don't want a frequency of each individual number. I would rather get something like the mean or a standard deviation. And so Jump is going to pay attention to this modeling type when I ask that question, because it's really the same question I'm asking about both columns, but the output should be different. And so let's do this all at once here. So I'm going to go to the distribution platform. So under the Analyze menu, and I'll talk more about platforms in a second, but this is a platform that's all about asking that one variable at a time question. What observations did I get in this column? So I'm going to pull open the distribution platform, and I'm going to do an operation. It's called casting a column into a role. That is, for me to move forward from this platform, I need to tell Jump what columns I want it to consider. 
And I could do this a couple ways. I could drag tip amount into the section. Notice I can just drop it there. Another way I can do this is grab a column on the left and click it into the Y roll. Those are casting the columns into this uh, distribution platform. When I click OK, and this is the output we got before, notice that jump really did something a little bit different for each of the different columns. For the numeric and continuous column of tip amount, it's shown us a histogram, quantiles, and summary statistics like the mean, something that makes sense for these type of data. For credit card use, I got a frequency table and a frequency distribution plot. So Jump has contextualized the output, uh, even though I asked the same question, what observations did I get in this column, it's given me the right kind of output. And the way Jump does that is because of the modeling type. Now there's a second aspect of Jump, and I before called this the fact that Jump is deeply hierarchical. Uh, and the way we kind of call it here is that Jump has a progressive interface. That is, as you produce analyses, like I did here with the distribution platform, Jump will give you new options, new things you can do that make sense given the context or situation you find yourself in. And what do I mean by this? So for tip amount, a column that has numbers and we calculated a mean and standard deviation, the next things we might want to do when we're in a one variable space with a continuous column, maybe we want to test a mean. You know, maybe historically we've observed a mean of $4 for tips on average, uh, but this last couple weeks, it looks like it's a little bit different. So maybe we want to know, did we change something in a restaurant? Did our servers do a worse job? Do we think this 3.84 is statistically significantly different from the mean of four that we've observed historically? Right, really a question of is the sampling error or is it really different enough to be concerned about our servers? Well, to move forward in this analysis, we don't go backwards. And in Jump, this is true always. You don't go backwards up the chain and relaunch the platform. Instead, you always go forward. And the way to go forward are these red triangles. And so you see them next to every uh, output and one for the main platform. Let me click the red triangle next to tip amount. And you'll see what I mean that Jump is going to offer me options that make sense in this context. So a numeric column that we're asking one variable questions about. Well, we can get something like a cumulative distribution plot. Uh, there's our testing mean option. We'll do that in a second. We can do things like getting confidence intervals for a different proportion. We can do continuous fits. So maybe we want to see if, uh, do we have evidence that these data are drawn from some particular distribution or we want to do a measure of fit against that. So these options all make sense given the context we're in. So let's do the one that we asked about, testing a mean. You know, under a null hypothesis that the mean historically has been 4, do we think 3.84 is so different that we should be concerned? I'm going to click OK. And notice that Jump doesn't produce a new window. Instead, we're, we're embellishing this current output that we have. And we've tested a mean. So we get our two-tailed p-value there. We get our actual degrees of freedom estimate, all the summary statistics and, and sort of inferential statistics we should expect. Now, you notice we got a little plot here. And this is true all across Jump. It's actually one of the ethos that's been with us for about 26 years, which is always show a graph when you're going to show a statistic. And the statistic of interest here is probably that two-tailed p-value. You know, how unlikely would it be if the population mean was 4 that we should draw a mean of 3.84 or more extreme? Well, that's really a question of the sampling distribution. And this is what this represents, the sampling distribution of the mean under that assumption, a mean of 4 in the population. And the shaded regions sum up to the two-tailed p-value. That is, how unlikely would it be to get 3.84 or less, or the other side of that, or more. Now, notice we get another red triangle. Jump is built again in this hierarchical way. Maybe we want to get a p-value animation, something that lets us explore had we specified a different null hypothesis mean, or had we observed 40 people instead of as many as we got, so we can see how that uh, sampling distribution of the mean changes. These are great for teaching as well, talk about power in your class, you can actually show with a power animation how different specifications of the null and alternative distribution uh, lead to your false alarms and lead to uh, your misses. All right, so let's back up here. We're talking about the progressive interface. Notice the jump contextualized both the output and the new options we got as we produced analyses. So we shouldn't expect when I click on the red triangle here, right? This is the same sort of question, one variable at a time, in jump, uh, but it's a different statistical context. We're working with a categorical column. So we shouldn't expect to see testing a mean, right? But maybe we would expect to see testing proportions or probabilities, right? Do we expect under the null that half of our table should use a credit card or not? And so we can specify this as well. And so I'll put in 0.5 and 0.5. 
so specifying under the null hypothesis, and we get our chi-square, goodness of fit, and Pearson. So notice that jump is doing something uh, rather important here. Uh, it is uh, contextualizing the output based on the modeling type of the data in the data table, that metadata that we set, and it produces analyses in kind of a special way. Most other software requires you to go to a menu and select the exact analysis you want. But notice we didn't see a one sample t-test in our menu. That one sample t-test we ran for the tip amount column that surfaced once we were in a platform, a location in Jump, a big room that basically contains all the analyses when we have a one variable question. And Jump surfaced that analysis in a particular context when we were in the distribution platform, but specifically in that platform with a continuous column. All right, so Jump will kind of help you uh, choose and make good decisions about what types of analyses you want to run. So at once, that's what I mean about the mind of Jump. It's concerned about the, sit the situation, the statistical situation, not the particular analysis or statistic you want to run. Jump is organized in this way where you find the room that does the types of things you want to do, and Jump will show you those options when you're using the types of columns that allow you to compute those operations. All right, so that's the modeling type and the progressive interface. Now just a couple tips for new users. Um, check out all the red triangles. Click all of them as you're learning Jump. And certainly right click. I mean, since Jump was built in 1989, this is a time when we had a mouse and we were working with a graphical operating system. Jump is built that way. You know, older software um, and legacy statistical software that's based on command line only, you know, they didn't have the affordances of a mouse, so they never built that into the software. Uh, but Jump works like modern software because it was built during a modern era. Uh, certainly customize your jump preferences. So under the jump menu for the Mac, you'll find the preferences. It's under the file menu for Windows. And the nice thing about customizing your preferences is every, every time you launch into a platform, you know, every time you run, let's say, a distribution on a categorical column, you can tell jump what you want it to show you. That is, you can embellish it with all the things you want. Maybe you want your axes on the left. You know, I've actually put a count axis on my uh, distribution output. That's not on by default. Uh, one thing I'll mention is if you're going to download Jump and use it yourself, when you run your distribution the first time, you're probably going to get your histograms oriented a different way. That is, if I go to the top red triangle, and these are options for the whole platform, notice I have stack as checked. By default, Jump comes with the tables and the columns like this, or sorry, the uh, the output in a vertical orientation like this, which is great when you have uh, normally a laptop screen that's wider than it is tall. That is, we can see more of the output all at once. But most people are used to seeing their histograms horizontally, which is why I like to show webinars with stack enabled. If you want to set that as a preference, you simply go to the preferences under your jump or file menu, go to the platform section on the left, and then find the platform you want to customize. Here I'll find the distribution platform, and notice I have stack checked. But maybe you want to have other things happen by default. Maybe you wanted to always test a mean of a certain value or show a stem and leaf plot or a CDF plot. Uh, since Jump is built around these little interfaces, you know, as we produce output, these are little interfaces to our data set. Customize them to work exactly the way you want. That way you're never wasting time producing output. It's always there right when you open it. So customize your Jump preferences. Remember that you can save your workout very easily. And so if I produce some simple output here, let me show you a couple of these. So let's say you wanted to take all of this output uh, and put it into a different format. On the Mac, it's file export. On the PC, it'll be file save as. Again, it works just like you would expect modern software to work. When you go to export, you see you have a number of different options. We can take the images only out as many different file types. If you're going to work with publication graphics, I recommend the scalar vector graphic. We can export this out as interactive HTML or a PowerPoint. Uh, what PowerPoint will do is create slides for each different output for you. And interactive HTML is a really great one, especially when you're sharing uh, your output with people who don't have Jump yet. Uh, you can save it out, and these actually open up in a web browser. And what's kind of neat about these is unlike basic HTML, these are still interactive. That is, they retain that cool interactive nature of the histograms and the graphics. And so if you want to share these on the web, people can actually still interact with your data. A note of caution on that, since they're interactive and people are interacting with the data, the data is stored in this HTML. And so don't do this with private data. Instead, export those out as images. Now, one final way to get output out of Jump, under the Tools menu, there's something called the Selection Tool. And this is really great. Simply select what you want. I'll grab that histogram, and it's as simple as Edit, Copy. And now if you were to go into any other program, you can simply paste it in. 
This works for the tables as well. So if you grab a summary table or quantiles or frequencies, these will copy into Excel or Word actually as tables. And so you can actually get output uh, really quickly and move it to other software. All right. Now, under the help menu, there's something I want to point you to, which is very useful when you're first learning jump, and it's the statistics index. So let me go there now, help, statistics index. And what this does is list out all the analyses that jump can do, and there's quite a few of them. Uh, but what's a value here is if I, let's say, go to multiple regression, uh, jump will give us a topic help, goes right to the help file for this section, uh, but also can launch the platform that does that type of analysis. And so this is what's called fit model in jump. It's under the main analyze menu. And so for multiple regression, again, because jump is going to pay attention to the type of data you put in, as soon as you specify a Y variable that's continuous, it's going to set a personality and we can build the model effects below. So presuming we want to do a multiple regression with two variables, right? So the statistics index is a great way to find where those analyses in jump live, uh, much like the jump starter does. So under your original window jump starter, you can also go under fit model or go under multivariate. You know, these sections allow you to find the particular analyses, uh, or particular platforms that do the analyses you want to do. And so as you're first getting to learn jump, those are handy, the statistics index especially. Uh, but once you kind of get familiar with how jump thinks about data, you'll have no problem finding the uh, platforms in which analyses live. Finally, if you uh, like reading documentation, I personally don't, uh, but we actually have really great documentation. So if you somebody who likes to read the manual, uh, go to the help book section and all the manuals are built in and so they're really nicely written we have a whole writing team that just designs the documentation and so these are very well written with examples and they use sample data and so you can learn jump that way at the end of today i'm going to point you to some other webinars and a lot of things that we build on the academic team uh, that i think get you up to speed a little bit quicker uh, the documentation is especially good when you're working with something uh, usually something a little more advanced and you want to actually see exactly what jump's doing and know about all the options so with some of the predictive and specialized modeling uh, i highly recommend looking through the documentation all right so with that I want to take you through a little bit of a tour of the essential platforms in Jump. We've already been playing with one of them, the distribution platform, uh, but I want to show you really in two big groups here. So platforms that are used for summarizing and graphing and platforms that are used for basic analysis. And so with summarizing and graphing, uh, the first one I showed you actually when I was just demoing Jump was Graph Builder. And we can actually keep the same data set open here. Graph Builder is really the place to go when you're creating a visual or exploring your data uh, visually. And it's under the graph menu. Now you notice that, because it's part of sort of Jump's ethos to always show a graph when it shows you a statistic, any platform in Jump you go to is going to give you a graph. Uh, graph Builder is about composing a graph or exploring your data purposefully graphically. Uh, you will actually get some statistics from Graph Builder if you ask for them, uh, but really Graph Builder is about designing a graphic. And we have other webinars that go into detail about how Graph Builder works, but let me just show you the basics. Graph Builder is built around drop zones. We have drop zones for data, the Y and the X, and then drop zones that break up the interior uh, based on the levels of another variable. And so that's group X, group Y, and wrapping. And then we have drop zones that embellish the graph. So overlay to add multiple layers to the graph, coloring and sizing, which affects the points. And so for instance, if we're looking at tip percentage, and I'll just drag it to the Y axis, as soon as I drop it there, jump creates a visual. Now it's just the points, and since there's no x variable, uh, they're simply points that are jittered to give you a sense of sort of the distribution. Even with just one variable, we can make a graph. Remember, we can do something like a box plot, right? That's something we would get from even the distribution platform. We can get a histogram. Histogram is going to be on its side since we put tip percentage as the y-axis. Uh, or we can get something called a contour. I kind of like this view. Uh, this is a view that shows sort of as a folded distribution. If I drag the points back on top, you see what Jump's doing is it's where the points are most uh, numerous, the contour expands out. So these are often called violin plots as well. And so showing the distribution of the variable. But let's turn that off. And actually, let's add another variable to the x-axis. Let's do something categorical. I'll do day of week. So I'm going to drag this and notice as I'm dragging that the zones where I can drop this column are all highlighted. So the X is where I want to go, but I could do this in many different places. As soon as I do this, the dots then get aligned into their groups. Again, the palette at the top allows us to select different visuals. 
maybe want a box plot. Box plots are great for looking at the distribution and seeing if there are points that sort of exceed our criterion for outlying this. Uh, but let's just do bars, a very simple representation of this. So we can look at the average tip percentage across the different days of the week. And I know it's the mean, both because the legend says that and because in the bar controls, the thing that controls what these bars are doing, the summary statistic is currently the mean. If we wanted maybe the median tip percentage, we can select that instead. I'm going to keep it on the mean. If we want to add additional variables to this plot, we have those other roles I mentioned. So for instance, maybe we want to know whether tip percentage varies as a function of credit card use in addition to day of week. So I'm going to drag credit card. I'm actually not going to drop it. I'm going to kind of hover it over some different roles. There it is for group for X. There it is for group for Y. Notice what those do is split up the axis such that we show those differently or overlay, which I like. So overlay will put the bars side by side. And actually, again, next to the bar style, notice that's what we have selected here. There's different ways we can do this. Maybe we want to have nested bars, bars where one was nested inside the other. I'm actually going to keep it on side by side. Now, one great thing about Graph Builder, it allows you to explore visuals and make sure that it tells the story you want to tell. Obviously, this visual allows us to really tell whether credit cards differ uh, our tip percentage rather differs by credit card. We've made that perceptually very accessible because the bars for credit card use or not are right next to each other. But suppose we instead wanted to look at for a day of week effects, the trend for day of weeks, and we didn't really care about the credit card use. We just wanted to separate it. Well, that would involve switching the credit cards with the day of week, actually moving those roles. Here's a nice tip. Right click a variable if you already have it in the graph. Go to swap and let me swap that with day of week. And suddenly now we're looking at for credit card use no and days of week as the different bars. And so we can swap variables to see what tells the story best. You know, this does tell us something, you know, on Tuesdays uh, with no credit card use, we have some high tippers, you know, maybe just for this week, probably just a few rows that, that played into that. So being able to swap your variables allows you to really easily try out different visuals and see what tells your story most forcefully. When you're done, just click done, and that closes the control panel. Remember your red triangles. You can always bring back a control panel if you want. So go to that red triangle and bring it back if you want to change things. Now, we have a, a webinar on data visualization that specifically is all about Graph Builder. So I'm not going to show you too much more of this, although we may play with it a bit for some mapping later. Uh, so if you are interested in Graph Builder, certainly check out that webinar, and I'll show you at the end how to get there. So for summarizing graphing, Graph Builder is really the place to go for graphing. But sometimes you really just need a table that leads or reads off statistics from your data set. Um, you may not even want a histogram. You simply want to tabulate the data. And the place to go for this is the tabulate platform under Analyze, Tabulate. And tabulate is really nice. Just like Graph Builder, it's built around the idea of drop zones. Drop zones for columns, for rows. And you see the cells that result once you specify those columns and rows. And let me show you what I mean. Imagine that we have a desire to, because maybe we manage this restaurant, find how much each server has brought in this week in terms of total bills. And so what we're eventually interested in is this bill amount column. But let's set up our rows first. And I'm imagining a table where I have one row for each of my servers. So let's actually drag a column into a role. Notice when I hover over the drop zone for rows, that section highlights. When I drop it here, Jump's going to quickly remake the table, and it's going to show us the first thing it can show us, just the number of observations that count as A's, B's, and C's. Now, we really want to do something additional, right? We want bill amount, not the count. So we need to involve the bill amount column. So let me drag this, and notice when I drag it over the sample sizes for each of those servers, it highlights. And when I drop it there, Jump's going to choose a summary statistic. Now the default summary statistic is going to be the sum. So it's showing us the sum or the total of bills for A, B, and C, which is actually what we wanted, right? So we wanted to see how much each person brought in. And we see that C brought in quite a bit fewer, but we did actually notice with the sample sizes that C worked fewer days. So perhaps that makes sense. Perhaps we don't want the sum then. We want to take out the effect of, of how many days or how many tables they had. So let's instead show the mean. To get the mean, let me drag that on top of sum now this is an important note. In jump, dragging on top of another variable is the replacement action. So when I drop on top of sum, it'll replace the sum for each of those servers with the mean. And actually in this case, we see that C on average brought in more per table. So C may have worked fewer days, but actually ended up bringing in more, more business for each table that they had. Now if we want to have an additional variable 
in this, not just the mean. What if we want to show the min and the max bill amounts for each of the different servers? Well, let me show you a drop zone not on top of the mean. Remember, that would replace it, but just to the right. So notice there's a little drop zone that highlighted just to the right of mean, and if I drop there, that's the appending drop zone. That tells Jump, add those statistics to this table. And so we can see the min and max for each server, for each of the tables they had. Now that little appending drop zone works for categories as well. Potentially, we might want to look at day of week effects. And so for instance, if I drop day of week on top of server, remember that's the replacement action. That will just replace the different servers. Let me click undo. Let's use the little appending drop zone. So just to the right of server, there's that little drop zone. And so I'm going to drop it there. And notice what we get now is a table with those categories nested. So for server A, the different days a week that server worked and all the statistics we asked for, and same thing for B and for C. Now there's also a prepending drop zone. If I grab day of week and drag it to the left of server, notice there's a little section there, I could actually nest in a different way. And this goes back to the same thing I said about Graph Builder. Try out different tables to see what really tells or makes clear the story you want to make clear. Notice with this sort of hierarchy, with the days of week and then servers nested inside of it, uh, we can make comparisons among the servers pretty directly for each day of week. Maybe that's the comparison we want. In the other version, what we're really able to compare easily is for each server, their day of week differences. And so the type of table you make depends on the type of question you have. Of course, they show the same data, it's just which shows it most forcefully and effectively. Just like Graph Builder, when you're done, you can click the Done button. This will actually make the little table now, just like everything in Jump, these are still interactive. As I select uh, basically statistics in this table, the associated rows going into that calculation also are highlighted. And so this allows you to actually use a little tabulation to interact with your table as well. If you want to make analyses on this table, potentially you want to turn this tabulation into a Jump table, click your red triangle, remember click all of these, and notice you have the option to make this into a data table as well. And so we can save this out as a data table of its own. So maybe this is something we want to actually analyze further. You know, sometimes tabulations aren't just to get summary statistics, but to get the data into a format that allows you to analyze them. All right, so that's tabulate. Tabulate is a really powerful way to do your basic summary statistics. Now for text and unstructured data, we actually have a new platform that uh, was added in Jump 13 I want to show you really quickly. Uh, this is actually some sample data on aircraft incidents, so accidents that happen. And we have this big long column here of the narrative. And so for each of the different incidents, we have a description. And going through these manually would be a lot of work, but under Analyze Text Explorer, just under the Tabulate option, there's the option to actually, tabu or actually to explore the text by pulling out common phrases and words that are used. And so I'm going to just put my narrative cause in my text column and click OK. There's a lot of other options we can specify, but notice what Jump does first is it pulls out the tokens or the words and phrases that make up the most common uh, sort of incidents that are in our data set. And so we see the most common phrase is a pilot failure, right? 484 times that was mentioned, or failure to maintain, or engine power. All right, so we can very quickly see what type of incidents we had and maybe what the causes are. Now often when we do this sort of text exploration, a nice visual, if I go to the red triangle and go to display options, is showing the word cloud. And so the word cloud is a nice way of just exploring what was happening. Uh, this is still interactive as well. So if we grab, let's say, pilot, I can right click and just select the rows in which that was mentioned. Or maybe landing was mentioned sometimes. So let me select the rows where landings were mentioned. And so this is both a way to explore and to uh, sort of get some summary of text data in your data set. But again, it's also a way to interact with it. You know, maybe once you've selected those rows, you want to just analyze those for some particular thing. Now, Text Explorer has a lot of other options. If you're working with Jump Pro, you get some advanced analytics with it too. Um, so with some singular value decomposition, you can do latent semantic analysis and topic analysis. You can cluster the terms and the documents, see which things tend to co-occur in your data set. And so these are some really nice options, especially when you want to explore a little more deeply and then potentially run some predictive analytics on the basis of the extracted dimensions from the text. And so that's Text Explorer, very much worth playing with. And again, that is a new feature in Jump 13. All right, so those are the basics for summarizing and graphing. Graph Builder for graphing, Tabulate for numeric tabulations, and we have Text Explorer for those open-ended or unstructured types of data.
Now let's look at some basic analysis platforms. We've already looked at the distribution platform. Uh, I noticed some highlights about it. Distribution is all about one variable questions. Like every platform in Jump, you just cast the columns into a roll when you start. And just like everything in Jump, the output is interactive. And one really nice thing about distribution, especially when you're first getting to know a data set, is screening for outliers. You know, not every point that's extreme is an outlier, but maybe there are points that are so extreme, this is not terribly extreme, but what if somebody tipped $150? Well, that may be a real tip. I mean, it could be a data entry issue. It could be a real tip also, but if you include it in analyses, being so far away from the mean uh, may distort results. It may just be such an exception you don't want to consider it. Remember, you can right-click points, and you can always hide and exclude. And so if you do detect things that are a little bit suspect, uh, you don't need to go searching for them in the data set. You can actually just hide them or mark them right there. Remember that distribution organizes itself like everything in Jump hierarchically. So as you produce analyses like testing the mean or testing for a continuous distribution, you'll get new options as you go along. And so the distribution platform is all about those one variable questions. Now I want to show you sort of a generalization of the distribution platform, and that's the multivariate platform. And for this, I'm going to bring up some body measurements. And so these are measurements for uh, about 22 individuals on a bunch of different physical characteristics. And we can look at the, the univariate or one variable distributions of each of them. But what if we want to know how they all sort of relate to each other? Not a question of whether one predicts another, although we can get that information from here. It's really a question of how do they all co-relate or co-vary. And so under the multivariate methods section, there's the multivariate platform. And I really see this as the generalization of distribution for numeric variables. And so I'm going to grab all my columns, click them into Y, cast them all into that role, and click OK. Now multivariate starts out with a correlation uh, matrix. And so each variable and how correlated it is with each other variable. I'm going to minimize that because I actually like looking at the scatterplot matrix. This is a nice way to look at basically how co-varying or how correlated each of these variables are. And we have this 95% density ellipse, which gives us a sense of their covariance or correlation, right? A more narrow ellipse, one with a longer uh, principal axis than the other, um, that means they're more tightly grouped around that, that sort of relationship. And ones that are more circular have less correlation. Again, click every red triangle. Sometimes you want to show the correlations actually on the scatterplot matrix. This gets a little busy with this many variables, so I actually don't tend to like that. Uh, one thing I do like to do is fit little lines. And so for each of these, we can actually get the little regression lines with the confidence bands. So a nice way to explore these data and just get a sense of what correlates with what. Again, the red triangles always have more options, and so we can do lots of things from multivariate. We can actually jump directly to principal components. We can do some really advanced outlier detection, so I really like the Mahalanobis distances. Uh, or we can get other things, like a 3D plot. So maybe we want to look at three of these variables and actually look at how they co-occur uh, sort of in three dimensions. And so multivariate is a great way of exploring those numeric data and something that I think you'll find a lot of value from. All right, so if we are trying to make predictions or trying to analyze the sort of effect of one variable on another, and we only have two variables that we're considering, that's the domain of fit y by x. And fit y by x is really the next option under distribution here, and it is just what it sounds like. We're trying to fit some y variable against some x variable. And if you think about it, there's several different ways that can happen. And again, it's constrained by the modeling type of the data. So depending on what the variable on the x-axis is, continuous or categorical, and what's on the y-axis, continuous or categorical, that sort of intersection is the type of analysis or output we should expect. And so if we're talking about continuous predicted by continuous, numbers predicting numbers, well, that's the domain of regression and a great number of other things, but principally regression. Categories predicting something numeric or continuous, well, that's sort of the domain of an ANOVA, so an analysis of variance or a comparison of means. Continuous things predicting categorical things, that's the domain of logistic regression. And categorical variables predicting categorical variables, well, that's contingency analyses and mosaic plots. So let's take a look at some of these. Notice we don't have to click anything. This is just a table to help you know what Jump's going to do. But let's predict something like tip percentage on the basis of, let's say, number of guests at the table. Hopefully we've well, actually, I don't know. What do we think we're going to find from this relationship? Maybe small tables feel more personal connection to their servers, so they tip a higher percentage. Or maybe big tables tip a higher percentage because everybody puts in money and so everyone over tips. Let's find out. I'll click OK. This will give us the output first. So these dots are really just showing in Y space for each number of guests. 
Now notice that jump didn't force us to do a regression. It's actually waiting for us to select what we want to do next. It just starts us off with that graph. And that red triangle is where we get to select what type of analysis we want. I'm going to fit a line. That's probably the most straightforward thing to do from this. We get our regression line of fit here. We get the output that tells us about the statistics. And probably more interesting for us, if we're looking, if there's a relationship between these variables, the parameter estimate for number of guests. That is, what is the slope? For each additional number of guests, what do we expect on average will increase for tip percentage or decrease? Well, we find it's not statistically significant, but let's interpret this. So for every additional guest, the tip percentage goes up 0.36 here. It's a 0.36%. Not a very big effect here. We're basically seeing that uh, people across any number of guests are tipping about the same. Okay, so let's keep this open for a second. I'll move it to the right. Let's imagine a different question, but still using the fit y by x platform, a platform that's about those bivariate relationships. How about number of guests, or sorry, tip percentage again, but instead of number of guests, let's predict based on credit card use. So whether somebody did or did not use a credit card. Well, this is going to come up with kind of a similar output at the start, right? We still have the, the dots and we have the no's and yes categories, but the drop down here is going to have different options. Of course, unlike the bivariate or the continuous predicted by a continuous, we're not going to be fitting a line that wouldn't make sense for categories. Instead, we'll be fitting something like a means or ANOVA or a t-test. The difference here is the means ANOVA and the pooled t-test that pools the variances or the estimates of the variance. And this t-test option uh, does it allowing the variances to be different. We also have different options. Maybe we want to check if the variances are different, so produce tests of unequal variances. Or the opposite of a null hypothesis test, an equivalence test. If we have some difference that we expect to be or know to be um, not relevant, we can test whether the difference in the population is less than some equivalent distance. Also, our non-parametric options are here. Notice Jump isn't forcing you to do a particular type of test. Instead, it gives you the options to do those tests based on when you select them. So I'm going to turn on the t-test. Like we saw with distribution, when we got a t-test, we actually get the representation of the sampling distribution, this time of the difference. Right, so fit y by x is all about those bivariate questions, and it's going to surface the types of analyses that make sense given what you've entered. And I'll just show you another two of these real quick. So if I go to fit y by x, this time let's put in something categorical, maybe credit card, and let's do two at once. I'm going to do number of guests, so maybe we think that categories or choosing to use a credit card varies as a function of the number of people at the table. And let's do something categorical, maybe something like server. So jump isn't going to do both of these variables as a multiple regression. Instead, we get two separate outputs. So jump will just put them in the same window. On the left, what we're looking at is really the probability of falling into a category, so using a credit card or not. So this is our uh, logistic regression, where we get things like an odds ratio. And on the right-hand side, we're getting a categorical by categorical mosaic plot. So showing us sort of over on the right-hand side the proportion of individuals who did use a credit card and didn't. And on this x-axis, the proportions of individuals who fell into each category, so the width of the axis here, A is the number of times A at a table, B is the number of times B at a table, and notice that C, the width of this column, is smaller, so we had fewer C tables. Really, the magic of the mosaic plot is on the interior. For the tables where A was the server, what proportion didn't use a credit card and what proportion did? And notice that the center line here isn't straight across, which is to say that the conditional proportionalities differ. That is, B actually had more tables where they didn't use a credit card, and C had a lot of tables where they did use a credit card. And so we can actually see if there is some contingent relationship here. Do we think that the proportion or probability of using a credit card depended on which server was serving them? So maybe we want to do this analysis if uh, maybe we think one server isn't trustworthy and people aren't giving that person their credit card. All right, so that's fit y by x for all bivariate questions. Now, when you move beyond bivariate questions, that is, you have more than two variables predicting a outcome variable or more than one outcome variable, that's where you get into the domain of fit model. And fit model is good for multiple regression and a great deal more. And so I'll just show you very quickly what fit model looks like, uh, but then we're going to have to end and I want to show you some of the uh, sort of the basics of the academic program. And so just so you know, fit model is built around your Y roles and model effects. And so if we were predicting tip percentage, but actually wanted to use two variables at once, credit card and number of guests, if I add those to the model effects section, instead of getting two separate outputs, one for credit card predicting tip percentage and one for number of guests predicting tip they're actually going to be used in the same model. And so we'll get partial regression coefficients.
Now, fit model is very general. So the personality we're using here is the most basic, standard least squares. We can also do stepwise regression, mixed models, MANOVA, log linear variance models. Uh, generalized regression has a, a whole wealth of penalized regression techniques as well as several others like quantile regression. And we have some very specialty models, partial least squares, response screening, and generalized linear modeling. And so fit model does quite a bit more. And so I invite you to look at some of our advanced webinars to see how that works. All right, so that's basic analysis. Now, before I take any questions, and I certainly want to, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the academic program in general in JUMP. So you can see a little bit about what JUMP does and why you know more than 70% of the top U.S. institutions actually teach with JUMP. Uh, there's a great blog post called Why Teach with JUMP I invite you to read. Uh, my journal will accompany this webinar on the website, so if you want to, you can click all these links or just search for that. When you're just getting started, though, I want to show you some places to go. And so when you're first getting started, jump.com slash teach is where I really recommend you go. That'll take you to our academic site. It'll auto scroll you down to the resources. So we have resources for learning jump. You've already found a webcast, so we have a lot more. Uh, we have a learning library. I'll take you there rather quickly. The learning library is built around types of analyses. So let's say you're teaching or trying to learn correlation and regression. If you go to that section, we list out the types of analyses that fit under that category. And for each of them, we have a video, two to five minutes long, and a one-page guide. And if you've never seen one of our one-page guides, these are pretty neat. So in a single page, using sample data, all the steps that you have to go through to do this type of analysis. And I love these actually when teaching. Um, I would use these as basically the uh, technology notes in my, my class. So I would actually assign these and put them up on uh, our course management software as just a bundle. And so students would actually have the exact steps. And so I didn't have to write them out. Um, so these are really nice too to use and they're free for use and use them any way you would like. And so that's the learning library here. So that was under uh, just the section for learning library. We also have a number of case studies, a whole group of them. So these are worked out examples using real world data and many of them also end with questions so they can be assigned as homework. Plenty of books use Jump. We also have e-learning courses. So for the campus licenses, you actually have whole courses uh, that can be assigned to students. They get a little certificate at the end. Uh, and as well, we have interactive learning tools. I showed you one of those before. The regression, actually I showed you two, the sampling distribution of the mean, uh, AP stats resources, and also interactive jump questions on WebAssign. So plenty of use and plenty of uh, materials for you to use. The learning library, again, I invite you to look at. I showed you that under jump.com teach, but you can also get directly there going to jump.com slash learn and the case studies and our webcast. We also have an academic community, jump.com slash JAC. So Jack, let me take you to Jack. Now at the Jump Academic Community is where I'll be posting this webinar. So under this collection for recent academic webinar recordings, just go there and I'll post it right at the top. And so you'll see a link for Jump Basics. Now, if you do want to look more into Graph Builder, I did mention that we had a webinar we just did on this, this webinar, Visualization and Graphics. That's an hour on just Graph Builder. There's so much you can do with it and it really is an amazing way to uh, work with data. Finally, when you're just getting started, jump.com slash get started and the new user welcome kit. These are all available there. Uh, these are great ways when you're first getting started with jump. And finally, if you're really just looking for a feature index, the jump.com stat index will show you that. All right, so just a couple highlights. So the Jump Academic Suite, which many of your campuses have if you're at an institution, uh, that's really the campus and department licenses. That's free for everyone to use once the campus gets a license. So there's no per person cost. Once the campus is licensed, everybody can use it at home or at work. Uh, if you wanna know how to get Jump yourself, this jump.com academic page I showed you before has a get Jump section. And we have lots of different ways you can get Jump the academic site licenses, the genomic site licenses. There's also individual licenses for Jump and Jump Pro, and also six month and 12 month licenses for students. So on the hub.com slash JMP. So for about a dollar a month, or I should say a um, dollar a week, well, it's $49 for a whole year for a student. And so quite, quite inexpensive, $4 a month. Uh, there's also Jump Student Edition, something that gets bundled with textbooks. And so it does most of the starting pieces of Jump and very great for a first or second course in Jump. Again, Jump, I think, um, and one of the reasons I love it mo most is that it's really about visualizing data and understanding data, certainly has a wealth of analysis, but um, it brings statistics to life. And I think that's a great thing when teaching because you can teach those concepts and not just software. You can really engage students. And we have a lot of resources out there when you're first getting started. Uh, textbooks incorporate Jump. We have the learning library and case studies and e-courses. And so a lot of things to help you get started. And actually us on all, all the academic team, Ruth and I and our other colleagues, Mia and Volker, we're all here to help as well.
So you can always email academic at jump.com or reach out to any of us individually. All right, so with that, and we're just out of time, but I'll stick around as long as anyone has questions. And uh, we thank you all for coming.